Today we're going to be discussing the anatomy of the skin and then once we have a basic understanding of that we're going to go on and work on the diseases and disorders of the skin. Yesterday y'all got to see a little demonstration about microdermabrasion so that give you a little understanding about the skin cells and uh, how to take care of them, how to get rid of wrinkles and things like that. The, the reason we're going to go on into the diseases and disorders is simply to protect ourselves and our client because some of these diseases and disorders, as you discovered, can be contagious or can cause us infections. When we get infections and things like that, we're not able to work on clients without gloves and some of our services are very difficult with trying to do them with gloves on. The medical branch of science that deals with the study of skin and its nature, structure, functions, diseases, and treatments is dermatology. And a lot of teenagers, and you, you were familiar with dermatology already because a lot of teenagers go to dermatology with the zits and the breakouts. A dermatologist is simply a physician engaged in the science of treating the skin, its structures, functions, and diseases. An esthetician is a specialist in the cleansing preservation of health and beautification of the skin. And what esthetician is, they train in cosmetology setting just like you do, but they do only skin, like a nail tech does only nails. And it is a technical certificate part of cosmetology if you want to, you know, specialize in skin. Nail tech is also a technical certificate of cosmetology. Cosmetology itself is a diploma and includes all of it. So if you, when you get your cosmetology diploma, then you can go out and work as an esthetician, although you don't have esthetician license, you know, because you've got the license that encompasses all of it. <coughs> the skin is the largest and one of the most important organs of the body. Healthy skin is slightly moist, soft, and flexible. It has a texture that is ideally smooth and fine-grained. Now remember, we had texture of the hair the coarseness of it, whether it was fine or medium. And skin is the same way. We look at different individuals, and our magnifying light in the facial room is especially helpful with that to see what the texture of the skin is. Healthy skin possesses a slightly acid reaction with good immunity responses to organisms that touch or try to enter it. All right. We're talking about acids such as on the pH scale. Now, you remember we rated the hair, skin, and nails with a pH of 4.5 to 5.5, which is slightly acid. And we know that anything that is not liquid or cannot be liquefied cannot have a pH. So we wonder about how the skin has a pH. But that it's called an acid mantle that coats our skin. And that comes from the secretion or excretions of the glands in the skin being sebaceous gland mostly but also sweat glands. Skin varies in thickness, being thinnest on the eyelids and thickest on the palms and soles. Continued pressure on any part of the skin can cause it to thicken and develop into a callus. The skin of the scalp is constructed similarly to the skin elsewhere on the human body, but the scalp has larger and deeper follicles to accommodate the longer hair of the head. So if you'll take a close look at the scalp, you can get in the magnifying mirror or look, and look at yours or look at somebody else and where the hairs come out and then look on your arms at the hair where they come out and you'll notice the follicles are not as large on other parts of the body as it is the scalp and that's what they're referring to. The skin is composed of two main divisions, the epidermis and the dermis. Which one was she working on yesterday with the microdermabrasion? epidermis. She was not totally removing the epidermis, but she was removing the dead cells and the different stuff we get on there um, through the run of the day or the week or whatever and the products we put on there. So the epidermis is the outermost layer of the skin. This layer is also called the cuticle or scarf skin. What's the outer layer of hair called? Cuticle? It is the thinnest layer of skin and forms a protective covering for the body. Contains no blood vessels but has many small nerve endings. And that's why sometimes we'll walk by something and scrape our skin and it kind of hurts. It even may burn a little bit. We look, we think we're going to see blood going everywhere, but there's no blood. But we failed it. So the nerves are there but no blood vessels. The epidermis itself is made up of the stratum corneum 
or horny layer. It is the outer layer of the epidermis. Its scale-like cells are continually being shed and replaced by cells coming to the surface from underneath. These cells are made up of keratin, which is fiber protein that is also the principal component of hair and nails. So our hair, skin, and nails are all protein products, and they're called keratin. When we studied hair, we talked about it being a hard protein, and we were kind of probably comparing it to T-bone steak, you know, and it is a hard protein for that, but it is a fiber protein, and steak naturally is not. Skin now is going to be referred to as a soft type of keratin because it feels a lot softer than the hair. The cells combine with a thin layer of oil to help make the stratum corneum a protective waterproof layer. The stratum lucidum is the clear transparent layer under the stratum corneum. It consists of small cells through which light can pass. Stratum granulosum or granular layer consists of cells that look like distinct granules. These cells are almost dead and they're being pushed to the surface to replace the cells that have been shed from the stratum corneum. The stratum granulosum, excuse me, stratum germinativum, formerly known as the stratum mucosum, might also be referred to as the basal layer. It's the deepest layer of the epidermis. It is composed of several layers of differently shaped cells. The deepest layer is responsible for the growth of the epidermis. Also, our dark skin pigment is contained there, and it's called melanin. It protects the sensitive cells below from the destructive effects of excessive ultraviolet rays of the sun and those from an ultraviolet lamp or tanning bed. Now, I remember yesterday in the demonstration she was talking about uh, the damage that's done by um, tanning beds especially. And if you'll notice, you'll see bloody places right under my skin sometime. And I hung with the tanning beds and the sun, being a real sun worshiper. And the sun has destroyed my stratum germinativum in my arms from my elbow down. I never wear sleeveless tops, so it hadn't got the top of them. And also right through here, I've had a had some problems. No, they're not little. Sometimes they'll go up my arm, and um, and uh, I went to a dermatologist with, and he explained all this to me, which all kind of lights went off. Which I knew this; I just didn't want to face it because I like the sun and the tanning bed. But the skin is a miracle substance, just like the rest of our body, or a min um, miracle machine, I guess you'd call it. He told me if I would stay out of the sun and keep sunblock on because you know you're going to walk to your car. And even through that part of time, you know she told you all to use the 30 SPF yesterday mm -hmm. on your face. Even though we may not go into the sun to lay out in the sun, we're out there a lot more than we think. Going from class to class, building to building, to the car, to Walmart, wherever we get out. And even riding in the car, we're in the sunlight. And um, mine are a lot better than what they were. It will reform itself after a period of time. But when it destroyed that, it destroyed my protective layer. So now as my uh, skin is fed through my capillaries, it just comes to the surface. So just a little hint to you, if you do the tanning bed thing or lay out in the sun a lot, that's where it gets you later on. These special cells are called melanocytes because they produce melanin, which determines skin color. The dermis, then, is the underlying or inner layer of the skin. It is also called the derma, the corium, the cutis, or the true skin. It's a highly sensitive layer of connective tissue that is about 25 times thicker than the epidermis. Within its structure, there are numerous blood vessels, lymph vessels, nerves, sweat glands, oil glands, and hair follicles, as well as our erector pili muscles that work in connection with the hair follicles and papillae, which are small cone-shaped projections of elastic tissue that point upward into the epidermis. The dermis is made up of two layers, the papillary or superficial layer and then the reticular or deeper layer. The papillary layer is the outer layer of the dermis directly beneath the epidermis. This is where you find the papillae, which are small cone-shaped elevations at the bottom of the hair follicles. 
Some of these papillae contain looped capillaries and others contain small structures called tactile, cor tactile corpuscles with nerve endings that are sensitive to touch and pressure. This layer also contains some melanin, so it's not all contained in the stratum germinativum. The reticular layer is the deeper layer of the dermis that supplies the skin with oxygen and nutrients. It contains the following structures within its network. Fat cells. Now, I want to call your attention to fat cells because although it contains some of the fat cells, it is not the fatty layer of skin. It contains blood vessels, lymph vessels, oil glands, sweat glands, hair follicles, and erectopelae muscles. We know it contains blood vessels. If we'd have scraped our arm just a little harder, it went into the epidermis and there would have been bleeding. Beneath the dermis is the subcutaneous tissue, and this is our fatty layer. It's found below the dermis, and some specialists actually regard it as a continuation of the dermis or a part of the dermis. Also might be called adipose tissue or subcutis tissue. It varies in thickness according to age, sex, and general health of the individual. And the book was real nice in saying that the general health of the individual, what that means is how much extra weight we've got on there as to how thick our subcutaneous is. It gives smoothness and contour to the body, contains fats for use as energy, and it protects as a cushion for the outer skin. So how then does our skin grow and reproduce and all that? Blood and lymph, the clear fluids of the body that resemble blood plasma but contain only colorless corpuscles, supply nourishment to our skins. As they circulate through the skin, the blood and lymph contribute essential materials for growth, nourishment, and repair of the skin, hair, and nails. Networks of these arteries and lymph vessels in the subcutaneous tissue send their smaller branches to hair papilla, hair follicles, and skin glands. Do y'all remember when we discussed the hair going through the zone of keratinization, how it grows and the amino acids begin to attach back with one another and then the side bonds? Basically, the same thing occurs, except naturally the skin doesn't go through the zone of keratinization because it doesn't come up through the hair follicle. But it goes through that same process of the capillaries leaking the blood for the nourishment that the skin needs. That's why massage is specifically good for the face. It gets the blood flowing and brings it up. The skin contains the surface endings of the following nerve fibers. Motor nerve fibers are distributed to the erector pili muscles attached to the hair follicles. This is what causes us to have goosebumps when we're frightened or cold. Sensory nerve fibers react to heat, cold, touch, pressure, and pain. These sensory receptors are what sends the messages to the brain that we've touched something that's cut us or we've touched something that's hot or whatever. Our secretory nerve fibers are distributed to the sweat and oil glands of the skin. Secretory nerves are part of the autonomic nervous system. They regulate the excretion of perspiration from the sweat glands. They also control the flow of sebum to the surface of the skin. And sebum is what our oil glands secrete or our sebaceous glands. We usually say my face is real oily. But what we really mean is we've got a lot of sebum coming from our sebaceous glands because that's, that is that oily substance. The papillary layer of the dermis houses the nerve endings that provide the body with the sense of touch. These nerve endings register basic sensations such as touch, pain, heat, cold, and pressure. Nerve endings are most abundant in our fingertips. And that's good for us. When we started to do service, did y'all remember I said something about we'd learn as, or tell as much with feel as we do with our eyes? And that's coming from our fingertips. Complex sensations such as vibrations seem to depend on the sensitivity of a combination of these nerve endings. Why is our skin the color it is? And if we look around, all of our skin is a different color. How many of us have the same color skin as our, one of our parents? Very few of us. It's an individual thing because we wind up a mixture of what our parents were. So our skin kind of is combo. The color of the skin, whether fair, medium, or dark, depends in part on the blood supply to the skin. 
but primarily it depends on melanin, the tiny grains of pigment that are deposited in the stratum germinativum of the epidermis and also deposited in the papillary layers of the dermis. The color of pigment varies from person to person. The distinctive color of the skin is a hereditary trait and varies among races and nationalities. Dark skin contains more melanin. Light skin contains less. Melanin has a purpose, though it protects the sensitive cells against strong light rays. A sun protection factor, or FPF, should be used to help the melanin in the skin protect it from burning. Did y'all notice yesterday when we were talking about the difference in, we had a light before that showed the sun damage to the skin, the last demonstrator that came in. And it was amazing because Miss Garrett's lighter skin than I was, but she had more damage than I had for the sun. So my melanin actually protected me a little bit from it because, you know, like it's your protective layer. Strength and flexibility of the skin. The skin gets its strength, form, and flexibility from two specific structures composed of flexible protein fibers found within the dermis. These two structures, which make up 70% of the dermis, are called collagen and elastin. And y'all had heard those words before you started reading this. Where had you heard them? TV. TV. Advertising face creams or hand creams or skin creams or makeup. So the companies are telling us now that they're putting collagen and elastin in the products that we buy. Collagen is a fibrous protein that gives the skin form and strength. The fiber makes up a large portion of the dermis and helps give structural support to the skin by holding together all the structures found in this layer. When collagen fibers are healthy, they allow the skin to stretch and contract as necessary. If collagen fibers become weakened due to a lack of moisture in the skin, environmental damage, or frequent changes in weight, the skin will begin to lose its tone and subtleness. Wrinkles and sagging are often the result of collagen fibers losing their strength. Collagen fibers are interwoven with elastic, which is a protein base similar to collagen that forms elastic tissue. This fiber gives the skin its flexibility and elasticity. Elastin helps the skin regain its shape, even after being repeatedly stretched and expanded. Both of these fibers are uh, important to the overall health and appearance of the skin, but aging takes away that. You remember we were talking about yesterday, it all begins to come downward, and the wrinkles in the face. That's why we do our manipulations up and out. As we age, these fibers weaken, causing the kind of wrinkling and sagging this was mentioned above. Keeping the skin healthy, moisturized, and free of disease will slow the weakening process and help keep the skin looking young longer. So now we're going to talk about the glands of the skin. And we have two types of glands. They're duct glands. Do y'all remember about your duct glands? We were studying anatomy. We had the duct glands and the ductless glands. The skin contains two types of duct glands that extract materials from the blood to form new substances, the sudoriferous or sweat glands, and the sebaceous or oil glands. And if you notice through studying this, the um, sebaceous glands are big time offenders to us. But on the reverse side, no matter what type of creams or lotions we, we buy, nothing will replace the natural sebum that our sebaceous glands secrete. And when you run up with the client that has excessively dry skin and hair, you will know that because no matter what we do, it's not going to be as soft and supple and flexible as somebody that has excessive oil. But then when we have the excessive oil, we tend to have all these breakouts and problem areas in our skin. So we're going to talk about the sudoriferous glands or sweat glands first. They excrete sweat from the skin. They consist of a coiled base or fundus and a tube-like duct that ends at the skin surface to form the sweat pore. Practically all parts of the body are supplied with sweat glands, which are more numerous on the palm, soles, forehead, and in the armpits. How many of y'all have ever gotten nervous and feel your hands get wet all of a sudden? That's simply your uh, pseudoriferous glands working. 
Sweat glands regulate body temperature and help to eliminate waste products from the body. Their activity is greatly influenced by heat, exercise, emotions, and certain drugs. The excretion of sweat is controlled by the nervous system. Normally, one or two pints of liquid containing salts are eliminated daily through sweat pores in the skin. The sebaceous or oil glands of the skin are connected to the hair follicles. They consist of little sacs that have ducts that open into those follicles. They secrete sebum, a fatty or oily secretion that lubricates the skin and preserves the softness of the hair. How many of y'all have ever heard the brush your hair a hundred strokes every night before you go to bed theory that they used to do? You know, they had healthier hair than we do. Of course, I don't think they had as pretty hair because we'd go out there and dye ours all different colors and curl it and straighten it and all that. But it made that hair shine because they distributed that sebum from the scalp area through all the hair strands. They didn't have the split ends we have either. Of course, they didn't have the blow dryers or curling irons that we have either. With the exception of the palms and soles, these sebaceous glands are found on all parts of the body, particularly in the face and scalp, where they are larger. Ordinarily, sebum flows through the oil ducts leading to the mouths of the hair follicle. However, when the sebum hardens and the duct becomes clogged, a blackhead is formed. There's a lot of functions of the skin. We kind of thought it was to put makeup on and get in the tanning bed with and all that. But that's not even the major function of the skin. Skin is on us for protection. What does it protect? The what? The body. The insides. How does it protect? We know we've got the skeletal system there protecting some of our major internal organs. So how does the skin protect the, our body? Invasion of bacteria. The invasion of bacteria. Viruses. Viruses and all that. That's why if you listen, sometimes you hear about people being burned badly. But they seem to, the burns seem to be coming along and all of a sudden they die. And most of the time it's from something like pneumonia or, or something, something else. And it's where our, the protective coating was no longer there to keep those things out. That is our best defense as hairdressers against disease too is unbroken skin. And it's one of the hardest things for us to have because we nip ourselves. We stick brush bristles in our fingers. We keep our hands in water, which destroys part of our protective covering. Another function of the skin is sensation. By stimulating sensory nerve endings, the skin responds to heat, cold, touch, pressure, and pain. When the nerve endings are stimulated, a message is sent to the brain. You respond by saying, ouch, if you feel pain, by scratching if you have an itch, or by pulling away when you touch something hot. Sensory nerve endings are located near hair follicles. Heat regulation. This means that the skin protects the body from the environment. A healthy body maintains a constant internal temperature of 98.6. As changes occur in the outside temperature, the blood and sweat glands of the skin make necessary adjustments to our body to be cooled by the evaporation of sweat, thus keeping us at that temperature. Another function of the skin is excretion. Perspiration from the sweat glands is excreted through the skin. Water loss through perspiration takes salt and other chemicals with it. Does it help get rid of waste products of the body? Sweat? Sure does. Is that important? That is vitally important. Secretion. Sebum or oil is secreted by the sebaceous gland. This oil lubricates the skin, keeping it soft and pliable. Oil also keeps hair soft. Emotional stress can increase the flow of sebum. When do you think is the time in our lives that um, sebaceous glands are greatly out of whack? Menopause. Think menopause. She was talking about it yesterday, but it's not the greatest time in our life. When is the the most change occur? Right, puberty, as we get, begin to go from a child to an adult. And that's why you see acne and also much more prevalent during that age. 
and it's caused from overactivity of the sebaceous glands and hormonal changes and all that have a big effect. Absorption, and this means things going through our skin. We know that when we put cream on our hands or legs, face, whatever, we can feel a difference in the skin, but we don't realize that certain substances can be absorbed into the skin because we think of it as a protective barrier. Very little can be absorbed, but it does have a degree of, of absorption. Absorption is limited but does occur. Female hormones, when used as an ingredient of a face cream, can enter the body through the skin and influence it to a minor degree. Thus, my statement a while ago, nothing is as good as the natural sebum because it doesn't have to go in. It's coming out. Fatty materials such as lanolin creams are absorbed largely through hair follicles and sebaceous gland openings. So aging of the skin is the process that takes many years and can be influenced by many different factors. One does not necessarily age as one's parents have. Many outside factors like the sun, the environment, health habits, and general lifestyle influence aging to a great extent that heredity has little to do with. How many of you can think back, and probably more so with your grandmothers maybe than your mothers, and when they were at the age that you are now, you think they were older than what you are. You understand what I'm saying? I think about the age I am now was the age Miss Brazel was when Fred and I got married, and Lord, it seemed like she was ancient. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, we're talking about the same number here. Why do you suppose the aging is different for generations? Well, it's changed, all right. When they were our age, they were, were, yeah, in the field somewhere. Working you think that had a lot to do with it, the working outside? The way they live. Mm -hmm. The way they live? The, the what's come along? The more things have come along. I mean, it's common now for a woman to smoke and drink and that kind of thing. But you would think that would be worse. Mm -hmm. Worse on the skin. Smoking and drinking both are skin mm -hmm. uh, destroyers. You think we have better products than all now to take care of the skin. We saw one of them yesterday, microdermabrasion. And I think we're out more, meaning we do more things that make us not seem quite so old. What was it in, in some year, 47 was the general lifespan of the population. You know, it hadn't been all that many years ago. And Medicines. So many things have changed. Technology. The sun and its effects. And this is another thing. Now, this is where they were one up on us because they, when they went out in that field to work, which was in the sun, they put on a hat and they put on long sleeve shirts. And we think the more clothes we take off, the cooler we'll get when we get hot. Actually, they were wise because what happened, the sweat glands work, the clothes become wet, and then the least little breeze, they were really cold. You know, they didn't have all this damage like we have either. Didn't have our pretty tans either. So the sun and its ultraviolet rays have the greatest impact on how our skin ages. Approximately 80 to 85 percent of our aging is caused by the rays of the sun. As we age, the collagen and elastin fibers of the skin naturally weaken. This weakening happens at a much faster rate when the skin is frequently exposed to ultraviolet rays without proper protection. The UV rays of the sun reach the skin in two different forms as UVA and UVB rays. Each of the rays influences the skin at a different level. UVA rays, also called the aging rays, contribute to 90 to 95 percent of the sun's ultraviolet rays that reach the surface of the earth. These rays weaken the collagen and elastin fibers causing wrinkling and sagging in the tissues. The UVB rays are called the burning rays. They cause tanning of the skin by affecting the melanocytes, which are the cells of the epidermis that are responsible for producing our melanin. Melanin is designed to help protect the skin from the sun's UV rays, but can be altered or destroyed when large frequent doses of UV light are allowed to penetrate. 
Although UVB penetration is not as deep as UVA, these rays are equally damaging to the skin and can damage the eyes as well. So we want to wear sunglasses. On a positive note, UVB rays contribute to the body's synthesis of vitamin D and other important minerals. As a result, to your clients, it is appropriate that you advise them about the necessary precautions to take when they are exposed to the sun. Where are one of the most common places to find a tanning bed now? In the beauty shop. And we sell them this, um, what do you call it? To boost it up? Accelerators. So it, they get more benefits from it. They also getting some more aging from it, aren't they, as we do that. As a consultant to your client, you need to advise them about the necessary precautions to take when they're exposed to the sun. Wear a moisturizer or protective lotion with a sunscreen of at least SPF 15 on all areas of the potential exposure. Avoid being in the sun from 10 to 3. That's when you're getting more of the direct rays. That's when we usually do it, isn't it? That's when it's fun to get out there. Apply sunscreen liberally after sw swimming or other activities that result in heavy perspiration. Better yet, sh sunscreen should be applied periodically throughout the day just as a precaution. All sunscreen used for protection should be full or broad spectrum to filter out UVA and UVB rays. When we first got to hearing about SPFs, the companies just had it to protect from one type of the rays. And the dermatologist finally stepped in and said, look, this is not going to work. You know, we're not selling this. This is giving them a false sense of security. you got to give them something, UVA and UVB protectant. Also check your expiration dates. Uh, this is important, kind of like food. If the expiration date's out, you don't want to be eating it. If the expiration date is out on your SPF lotion, don't be using it because, again, you think you're protected, but you're not. Avoid exposing children younger than six months of age to the sun. If prone to burning frequently and easily, wear a hat and protective clothing. Redheads are particularly susceptible to sun damage. In addition to following these precautions, clients should be advised to regularly see a physician specializing in dermatology for checkups of the skin, especially if any changes in coloration, size, or shape of a mole are detected. Some home self-examination is an effective way for potential skin cancer. When performing a self-care exam, clients should be advised to check for any changes in existing moles and pay attention to any visible growth on the skin. While the sun may play the major role on how the skin ages, changes in our environment also greatly influence the aging process. Pollutants in the air from factories, automobile exhaust, and even secondhand smoke can influence the appearance of the skin and the health of the skin. While these pollutants affect the surface appearance of the skin, they can also change the health of the underlying cells and tissues. So we age even faster. The best defense against these pollutants is the simplest one. Follow a good daily skin care routine. That first means cleansing the skin properly. Routine washing and exfoliating or removing dead surface skin cells at night helps to remove the buildup of pollutants that have settled on the skin's surface. The application of moisturizers, protective lotions, and even our foundation products all help to protect the skin from airborne pollutants. How many of you know if your foundation has an SPF factor in it? If you, if you use foundation and don't know, check on it. Aging and lifestyle. Aging of the skin is not or absolutely outside influences. It's some of the things we do, such as smoking or using tobacco. Nicotine in tobacco causes contraction and weakening of the blood vessels and small capillaries, and that's how our skin is fed. So we mess that up, no longer able to grow and reproduce as it should. The use of illegal drugs affects the skin as much as smoking. Some drugs have been shown to interfere with the body's intake of oxygen, thus affecting healthy cell growth. 
Some drugs can even aggravate serious skin conditions such as acne. The use of alcohol has an opposite yet equally damaging effect on the skin. Heavy or excessive intake of alcohol overdilates the blood vessels and capillaries. This constant overdilation and weakening of the fragile capillary walls cause them to burst. That's why we often see the little red spider webby lines on somebody's face that's done a lot of drinking. It usually comes right across the nose and cheek area. Both smoking and drinking contribute to aging process on their own, but the combination can be devastating to the tissues. And I might add about smoking and drinking in combination is cancer has been found to be worse in soft tissues of the person that smokes and drinks together and excessively. You understand what I'm saying? If you smoke, you may get soft cell skin cancer. If you drink, you may get it, but the combination of the two really makes it bad. All right, what we've all been waiting for, disorders of the skin. You can't wait for this, can you? Like any other organ of the body, the skin is susceptible to a variety of diseases, disorders, and ailments. We're going to often see skin and scap disorders. We need to learn to recognize them. We're not going to diagnose skin problems. But we need to recognize, is this dangerous to be working on? Is this something we can help? Is this something she's got to see a doctor about. Some skin and scalp disorders can be treated in cooperation with and under the supervision of a physician. Medicinal preparations available only by prescription must be applied in accordance with the physician's directions. If a client has a skin condition that you do not recognize as a simple disorder, make sure you tell them to go to the physician. Make sure you don't be touching it either. It's very important that a beauty salon does not serve a client who is suffering from an inflamed skin disorder, whether it's infectious or not. We don't want to work on someone with an inflamed skin disorder because of doing more damage to it. It's already sore and red and contains pus. The cosmetologist must be able to recognize conditions and sensitively suggest that proper measures be taken to prevent more serious consequences. So the health of us as well as the health of clients is safeguarded. We're going to talk about a number of important terms relating to the skin, scalp, and hair disorders that you should be familiar with. First of which is a lesion. A lesion is simply an injury or damage that changes the structure of tissues or organs. Three types of lesions we're concerned with, primary, secondary, and tertiary. We're concerned with primary and secondary lesions only. If we're familiar with these principal skin lesions, you will be able to distinguish between conditions that may or may not be treated in a beauty salon. Our primary lesions are bulla, a large blister containing a watery fluid similar to a vesicle but larger. Would we be concerned with touching that or working with it? It in and of itself may not be a problem to us. But if we were to burst it, it could become a, we got body fluids now. A cyst. It's a closed, abnormally developed sac containing fluid, semi-fluid, or morbid matter. It can be above or below the skin. What is morbid matter? Hard. Hard? It was, it was certainly, <laughs> to us, would be nasty. Wouldn't it be like morbid, like the dead skin cells that have accumulated there and maybe our sebum is holding it there or we just have it exfoliated? That's what we were talking about yesterday, the importance of exfoliating. A lot of people know the importance of cleansing, but cleansing does not do it all. It doesn't take it all off, especially if we've got a little bit of oil in this, we need to exfoliate. Would we be concerned with the cyst? Somewhat, but we're not going to be overly concerned with it. Um, we'd be careful not to open it. And if, if we were going to do something with it, we thought we might. We want to glove up, but we're not going to be overly concerned with it. Macule. It's a spot of discoloration on the skin, such as freckles. Macules are neither raised nor sunken. Are we concerned about that? 
No, we'll clean over them all day long, put makeup on them. It don't matter to us. Papule. It's a pimple, a small circumscribed elevation on the skin that contains no fluid, but it may develop pus. We concerned with it? If it's got pus in it, we're concerned with it. But actually, during the facial, we're trying to cleanse this skin and exfoliate this skin and get rid of these uh, papules. Pustule is an inflamed pimple containing pus. That throws up a red flag, says so put on some gloves. You can still work on them, but put on some gloves. Just, you know, be careful around that area. Tubercle is an abnormal rounded solid lump above, within, or under the skin. It's larger than a papule. Does that bother us? Concerned about it? No, we may not like it, but it's not going to bother us. Tumor. It's a swelling or an abnormal cell mass resulting from excessive multiplication of cells, varying in size, shape, and color. Nodules may also be referred to as tumors, but are smaller. We concerned with them? No. Bascule. It's a small blister or sac containing clear fluid lying within or just beneath the epidermis. Poison ivy and poison oak, for example, produce vascules. We concerned about them? Yeah. Yes, we are, because that fluid's going to come out, and we don't want any part of it. Wheel. It's an itchy, swollen lesion that lasts only a few hours caused by a blow, the bite of an insect, or the sting of a nettle, such as hives and mosquito bites. We concerned with it? Our tendency is to say no, but have you ever been bitten by something and a drop of blood come to the surface from it? We concerned about blood. Remember, we don't want to be handling anybody's blood. Our secondary lesions are those that develop in the later stages of disease. These include a crust, which is dead cells that form over a wound or blemish while it is healing. It's an accumulation of sebum and pus, sometimes mixed with epidermal material. An example is the scab on a sore. We want to be handling that. No, we don't. Even if there's no pus present, there's all kind of stuff mixed in with that scab. And besides that, we don't want to re-injure or pull that scab loose. Excoriation. It's a skin sore or abrasion produced by scratching, scratching or scraping. We concerned about it? We're not concerned about catching something from it. We simply don't want to handle it because it may have blood or body fluids coming out of it. Fissure. It's a crack in the skin that penetrates the dermis, such as chapped hands or chapped lips. And again, we're not overly concerned with that, but if the skin is cracked, then we may have body fluids escaping. Keloid. It's a thick scar resulting from excessive growth of fibrous tissue. Are we concerned about it? No. no. Scale. is any thin plate of epidermal flakes, dry or oily. An example is abnormal or excessive dandruff. Are we concerned with it? We are concerned with it. Dandruff is a contagious disorder. True dandruff is. Not only can we catch it, we can get it on our equipment and spread it from client to client. Scar or cicatrix. It's a light colored, slightly raised mark on the skin formed by an injury or lesion of the skin that has healed. We concerned with it? Not a bit. Ulcer. Is an open lesion on the skin or mucous membrane of the body accompanied by pus and loss of skin depth. We concern. Red flag goes up there. There's pus. Disorders of the sebaceous or oil glands. Several common disorders of sebaceous or oil glands that we're able to understand and identify. Some of these we can do something about because remember now we're talking about disorders. <laughs> A comedon or blackhead is a worm-like mass of hardened sebum in a hair follicle. Comedons appear most frequently on the face, especially the forehead and nose. When the hair follicle is filled with an excess of oil from the sebaceous glands, a blackhead forms and creates a blockage at the mouth of the follicle. Blackheads should be removed under sterile conditions using proper extraction procedures. Should the condition become severe, medical attention is necessary. Milia also are called whiteheads. They are small, whitish, 
pearl-like masses in the epidermis. If your book says pear, they left the L off. It's pearl-like. They look just like the surface of a pearl when you see them. So mealy or whiteheads are small whitish pearl-like masses in the epidermis due to retention of sebum. They can occur on any part of the face, neck, back, chest, and shoulders. Milia is usually associated with fine textured dry types of skin. Acne. Acne is a skin disorder characterized by chronic inflammation of the sebaceous glands from retained secretions. It occurs most frequently on the face, back, and chest. Acne or common pimples is also known as acne simplex or acne vulgaris. Two basic types of acne are the simple acne and the more serious acne vulgaris. It's also advisable for the client to have the condition examined and diagnosed by the physician before receiving any service in the salon. In other words, we don't want to be messing around with it until the doctor says it's okay. You've got to remember this is a scarring disease or disorder. Seborrhea is a skin condition caused by an abnormal increase of secretions from the sebaceous gland. An oily or shiny condition indicates the presence of seborrhea. It's not contagious. We're not concerned about catching it. Asteatosis is a condition of dry, scaly skin due to a deficiency or an absence of sebum. It's caused by old age and by exposure to cold. Rosacea. Y'all was telling me a while ago about collagen and elastin. You heard it on TV. Do you hear anything about rosacea on TV? Mm -hmm. They've not found a cure for rosacea because they still have not found the cause of rosacea until you find out what causes something. You usually can't cure it. But they have found some medication now that works well with a lot of clients that have rosacea. So rosacea was commonly called acne rosacea. It's a chronic congestion appearing primarily on the cheeks and nose. You can notify it or identify it by redness, by dilation of the blood vessels and the formation of papules and pustules. The cause of rosacea is still unknown, but certain factors aggravate the condition. These include spicy foods, caffeine, alcohol, exposure to extremes of heat or cold, and also sunlight and stress. Steatoma is a sebaceous cyst or fatty tumor. It's filled with sebum and ranges in size from a pea to an orange. Usually appears on the scalp, neck, and back. Steatoma is sometimes called a wind. And what this happens is when uh, it's filling up with sebum, it's backing into the skin instead of us seeing a blackhead. And we might see the pore getting a little bigger or the follicle getting a little bigger, but it stays down in there and after a while we feel this hard lump and then we try to get it out thinking it's something like a blackhead and sometimes you're successful but most of the time you've got to go have them surgically removed because as they grow it begins to sometimes cause pain. Disorders of the pseudoriferous or sweat glands. Anhydrosis is a deficiency in perspiration often caused from a fever or certain skin diseases. This person needs medical treatment. Bromhydrosis is foul-smelling perspiration, usually noticeable in the armpits or on the feet. And I might also caution you sometime about bromhydrosis. The foods we eat can sometimes be detected in our sweat, especially onions and garlic. Hyperhydrosis is excessive sweating caused by heat or general body weakness. Medical treatment is required for that. Miliaria rubra, it's prickly heat. It's a, an acute inflammatory disorder of the sweat glands characterized by the eruption of small red vesicles. It's accompanied by burning, itching skin. It's caused by exposure to excessive heat. You might notice babies, if they get real fat and have the little rolls of fat, they'll begin to get the prickly heat in between the little rolls of fat. Some inflammations of the skin. 
Dermatitis is an inflammatory condition of the skin. The lesions come in various forms such as vesicles or papules. And usually when we see somebody that's got some type of skin disorder, that's what we call it is dermatitis. Just tell them you've got some form of dermatitis. Go to the doctor with it and let them diagnose it. Eczema is an inflammatory, painful, itching disease of the skin. may be acute or chronic in nature. Presents many forms of dry or moist lesions. All cases of eczema should be referred to a physician for treatment. The cause of it is also unknown, so there's no cure for it either. Herpes simplex, or fever, blister, or cold sore. This is a viral infection that recurs. It's characterized by the eruption of a single vascule or group of vascules on a red swollen base. The blisters usually appear on the lips, the nostrils, or other parts of the face. They rarely last more than a week, but they are contagious. Psoriasis is a skin disease characterized by red patches, covered with white silver scales usually found on the scalp, elbows, knees, chest, and lower back. Rarely occurs on the face. If irritated, bleeding points occur. It's not contagious. We'll have a lot of people that have psoriasis come and want permanent waves or hair color or something. And we're going to usually notice it because right around the hairline, and I call that part of the face, the book says not, but it's right there. You can see it. They go into what they call the remission. There's periods of time you don't see the psoriasis. They can get a perm or something during that time, but when you're seeing them, you don't need to be messing with them, you know, and putting a chemical on because of irritating them. Occupational disorders in cosmetology. Cosmetologists must be sensitive to skin disorders not only in their clients but in ourselves. Frequent contact with chemicals results in abnormal skin conditions. We may develop allergy to the ingredients in some of our cosmetics or cold waving lotions. They can cause eruptive skin infections known as dermatitis veneata. In our work, it's important that you employ protective measures. I keep a protective cream on my desk in there, and we also have gloves all the time. I want to talk about some pigmentations of the skin. Pigment can be affected from inside or outside the body in abnormal condi conditions, such as prolonged exposure to the sun or other elements. Abnormal colorations also accompanies every skin disorder and many systemic disorders. Change in pigmentation can be observed as well when certain drugs are being taken internally. <coughs> Excuse me. The following terms relate to changes in the pigmentation of the skin. Albinism. It's congenital leukoderma or absence of melanin pigment of the body. It includes the skin, the hair, and the eyes. Silky hair is white. The skin is pinkish white and will not tan and the eyes are pink have to keep these people out of the sun because they'd really blister. They age early. Um, I was looking and picked up this magazine for Fred and Clint one day last week, a hunting magazine, and it's supposed to be just about Georgia, something about Southern sportsmen or something. And there was a picture that somebody's field camera had taken of an albino deer. And that deer was just totally, was strange looking really, totally white. Cloasma. It's a condition characterized by increased pigmentation on the skin in spots that are not elevated. Clasma might also be called moth patches or liver spots. And yesterday they were referring to the dark spots that people get when they're pregnant. And all this is just what we're talking about. Lenten genes or lentigo is a technical term for freckle, and we know we're not worried about that. Leucoderma is a skin disorder characterized by light, abnormal patches caused by a burn or a congenital disease that destroys the pigment-producing cells. It is classified as vitiligo or albinism. So let's talk about vitiligo. Vitiligo is milky white spots or leucoderma of the skin. It is an acquired condition. These individuals must be protected from the sun. This is what Michael Jackson was said to have had. There's been several of our stars that have had it. But they just gradually, place to place, lose the pigmentation of their skin. So he didn't do that on his own? 
I don't know. Some people believe he did, you know, but vitiligo goes along the same avenue as what he, what occurred with him. And I notice he always uses an umbrella. Of course, if he could have done that on his own through bleaching agents, he would have had to protect the symptoms. I don't know. But they did say he had vitiligo. Nevis, small or large mouth formation of the skin due to abnormal pigmentation or dilated capillaries, commonly known as a birthmark. We're not concerned about that. A stain is an abnormal brown or wine-colored skin discoloration with circular and irregular shape. Its permanent color is due to the presence of darker pigment. Stains occur during aging after certain diseases and after the disappearance of moles, freckles, and liver spots. The cause is unknown. But aging, if you'll notice, a lot of people call them age spots. They begin to get them on their arms and hands. A tan is a change in pigmentation caused by exposure to the sun or ultraviolet rays. Now some hypertrophies of the skin. Hypertrophy of the skin is an abnormal growth of the skin. Many hypertrophies are benign or harmless. And we're not really that concerned about them. What we're concerned about is the ones that are not. Keratoma is an acquired superficial thickened patch of epidermis commonly known as callus. It's caused by pressure or friction on the hands and feet. If the thickening grows inward, it is called a corn. Mole is a small brownish spot or blemish on the skin ranging in color from pale tan to brown or bluish black. Some are small and flat and look like freckles. Others are raised and darker in color. Large dark hairs often occur in moles, and any change in a mole requires medical attention. We never remove hair from moles. Skin tag is a small brown or flesh-colored outgrowth of the skin. Skin tags occur most frequently on the neck of an older person. And as bad as I hate to say this, because I know I'm not older, I've got several. Baruca is a technical term for wart. It's a hypertrophy of the papilla and the epidermis. It's caused by a virus. We hear that? It's caused by a virus. It is infectious. It can spread from one location to another, particularly along a scratch in the skin. Now our skin cancers. Skin cancer from overexposure to the sun comes in three distinct forms varying in severity. Each is named for the type of cells in our body that it affects. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common. Thank goodness it's the least severe. It's often characterized by lighter pearly nodules. Squamous cell carcinoma is more serious than basal cell car carcinoma and is often characterized by scaly papules or nodules. The third and most serious form of skin cancer is malignant melanoma. It's often characterized by black or dark brown patches on the skin that may appear uneven in texture, jagged or raised. Malignant melanomas often appear on individuals who do not receive regular sun exposure and are most commonly located on areas of the body that are not regularly exposed, often called the city person's cancer. Malignant melanoma is the least common but the most dangerous type of skin cancer. Detected early, you have a good chance of survival and cure rate. So whenever you notice anything, whether it's on you or one of your clients, make note, tell your client, get it seen about. So now that we know some of the maladies of the skin, we want to talk about how to maintain the health of the skin. We know that vitamins and dietary supplements are all out there and creams and all that. And it's a matter of getting the right thing and the right amount. The best way to take care of your skin is to drink plenty of water to hydrate it and to eat properly and not depend on eating a hot dog and potato chips for dinner and supper and breakfast and then going and getting a bottle of vitamins. Because our body actually uses our food better than it does vitamin supplements. Vitamins play an important role in the skin's health, often aiding in healing, softening, and fighting diseases of the skin. Vitamins such as A, C, D, and E have all been shown to have positive effect on the skin's health when taken internally. 
Although experts agree that taking vitamins internally is still the best way to support the health of the skin, some external applications have also been found to be useful in nourishing the skin. Vitamin A supports the health of the skin. This vitamin aids in the health, function, and repair of skin cells. Vitamin A is an antioxidant that can help, that can help prevent certain types of cancers, including skin cancer. It has been shown to improve the skin's elasticity and thickness. It's a topical, in its topical acid form as the prescription cream called retinoic acid or retin-A, vitamin A can be used to treat many different types of acne. Vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid, is an important element needed for proper repair of the skin and other various tissues. This vitamin aids in and even speeds up the healing process of the body. Vitamin C is also vitally important in fighting the aging process. It promotes the production of collagen in the skin's dermal tissues, keeping the skin healthy and firm. Vitamin D promotes the healthy and rapid healing of the skin. The best source of this vitamin is sunlight in limited amounts. You know, all of our growing up years, most of us was taught that vitamin C was the sunlight vitamin. And now we find out vitamin D. Because vitamin D helps to su support the bone structure of the body, it has been made readily available in fortified foods and dietary supplements. Vitamin E is used in conjunction with vitamin A helps fight against and protect the skin from the harmful effects of the sun's rays. Vitamin E also helps to heal damage to the skin's tissue when used both internally and externally. Water and sun. We need to drink a lot of sun, get, uh, drink a lot of water, get a little bit of sun, keep our faces and skin cleansed and exfoliated. Should relieve us of problems. Do we have questions? All right. 